Hi, welcome to Doc NYC's 2022 Spring Showcase, our mid-year celebration of documentary films and series. I'm Ruth Samalo, Senior Features Programmer at Doc NYC, and it's my pleasure to be speaking today with writer-director Eli Roth and activist and conservationist Reggie, Reggie Domingo, who will be discussing the documentary Finn, a Discovery Plus original production. Welcome, Eli and Reggie. Thanks for being with us. How are you? Good. It's great to be here. We love we love talking about this. We we feel like we're always we we text fifteen times a day about shark related stuff. So it's nice to be sharing it uh, with everyone else. Nice. Hi, Reggie. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm amazing in Mexico, in beautiful Mexico, Baja California Sur. Um, trying to save sharks as always, and very happy to be here with you guys. So the statistics that you guys present us with are like mind-blowingly high, like populations of sharks like being decimated, you know, decreased by 90%, 100 million sharks slaughter every year. And you do explain the deep connection between how the sharks are linked with the balance of the marine ecosystem. So this is a big freaking deal. Like, you know, I had no idea how important this is. And, you know, you told us in the film about your early interest in sharks, Eli, but perhaps you can both tell us a little bit about uh, what was the igniting element that led you to take part in this project? Well, for me, I it was when I went diving with them. You know, I love sharks, but I had heard, oh, sharks want to eat you. And I got in the water with them. And of course, the greatest way to get over your ignorance or fear of something is to confront it. And I, of course, realize how the whole thing, the media blows sharks way out of proportion. You know, more people are killed by armed three-year-olds than sharks every year. Uh, I was amazed at how shy they were, cautious, intelligent, careful. They have absolutely no interest in eating us. When people are bitten, it's a mistaken identity. They really think they're biting a fish and they, you know, they let go, they release. So uh, while I was doing stuff on Shark Week, kind of hosting this talk show really to learn, I met all these incredible activists and everyone kept saying, it's just so sad what's happening. You know, 18,000 sharks an hour are being killed. And a lot of sharks take 11 to 15 years to reach sexual maturity to reproduce. So I was like, how are there going to be any left? Um, and I said, I have to do, you know, I, I have a reputation for horror movies and sharks are always portrayed as monsters. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to do a documentary that is scary, but where the humans are the monster. And we were just so lucky that, you know, it was Dr. Reese Halter, this environmental scientist and Joe Romero who, who put us onto Reggie Domingo. And they said, the place you should start was, was Reggie. So Reggie was actually our first interview. Our first day we went out with the shark fishermen and it was very important that we not vilify anyone, we not demonize anyone. Everyone's a human being, everyone has a certain point of view, but I really wanted to under show and understand how, how is this happening? Why is this happening? And you know, it's just, it's all for money and, and our kids are gonna pay the price for it. And Reggie, how was it for you? Like, when did you start getting involved with them, um, with conservational efforts? Well, so my conservation story starts in back in 2010 when I literally fell in love with Cocos Island, an island that is in Costa Rica, offshore Costa Rica, through a documentary, uh, through a film, Shark Water. Um, so from there, I tried to do my best to arrive to that island and volunteer with the government against illegal, illegal fishing. And that experience that lasted 63 days volunteering in this national park and World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, was what it, it made me the life goal. I needed to change everything I was doing, start a, a project, a nonprofit organization, and try to expose and explain what was happening. Um, I felt like there was a misunderstanding, a lack of information of you know, like the topic of around sharks, the topic about overfishing sharks. And that was my starting point. Of course, my career had had so many ups and downs. It's a very difficult path and journey. And little I know that after some years, I will be involved in, in, in work, literally work in documentaries with Rob Stewart, which was my hero, my, you know, like this person that you want to work with to save sharks. And the reason I got involved with Finn uh, was literally, as, as Eli said, uh, Joey Romero put us together. I try my best to be involved as many times as I can to bring voice to these animals. I, I, I lived a very hard experience losing Rob Stewart as a friend and as a conservation brother. 
Uh, and I kind of felt like this was an amazing opportunity to bring somebody like Eli and the attention of the world into the communities of where I was working at the time or I'm working at the time that is Mexico, Baja California. It's another opportunity to get involved with other humans that want the same goal. I think media can change lives and it actually changed my life back in 2010. And that's the reason I started. So I want to inspire more people, help anybody that needs any input from my side or information from my side. And of course, help the locals in Baja through media. I think we can bring the enough attention to change their economy. That's the most important thing to do. And any opportunity to do that, I'm going to be in. And I should say that obviously Rob Stewart and Sharkwater was a huge inspiration. And people would say to me, well, Sharkwater already exists. And I said, of course, but Rob wouldn't stop. I mean, the problem is getting worse. And I think a lot of people think, well, I'm never going to eat shark soup. I don't go to China. How does it affect me? So we wanted to show how it's in cat food. It's in cosmetics. It's in these fake health products. And up and down the East Coast of the United States, there are these horrible monster shark fishing tournaments. And they say, oh, we're catch and release. Well, if you drag a hammerhead shark 30 miles an hour, the stress it releases so bad, as soon as they release them, the sharks die from the stress of the near-death experience. So there is no such thing as catch and release. Everything is catch and kill. But also to show the point that there's literally no reason for a shark to be out of the water, none. The, when you eat the soup, the neurotoxins damage your brain. They cause Alzheimer's, they cause impotence, they cause neurological disease. And the, the fin has zero flavor. I mean, it's literally like eating calcium in a fingernail. So I went in the kitchen in China and I wanted, I wanted to try and understand this. And really it's about money and it's EU subsidies. And the fishing industry spends billions of dollars brainwashing everybody to say, there's plenty of sharks. It's totally sustainable. It's fine to kill them. To look the other way when really, you know, you can already start to see the algae blooms that are growing. Um, you know, I'm sure Reggie sees it in Mexico all the time, the imbalance of the ecosystem. I mean, in one day when we went out there, I mean, they, they caught this pregnant, you know, you see it in the film, there's a pregnant sharks, you know, nine sharks and one hook. It was, I was devastated. And I just had the most, such admiration for Reggie and Joe Romero and Gary Stokes and Peter Hammerstead. And everyone in the film that's really on the front lines, you know, walking the walk and doing this every day, uh, because it is a very lonely, isolating battle. And you need someone like Reggie who, you know, takes months to earn the trust of these fishermen and then, you know, try to show them that this is not a sustainable thing. That, you know, if, if you do ecotourism, you know, one shark can earn $250,000 in dive tourism and dead, it's worth $25. So even economically, it's insane to kill them. You've just answered like the 20 questions I had. For Sorry, you. I've, we, oh, we both have so much information. We feel like we have to get it out. I really should parse it out more. No, no, it's fantastic. Um, and, and thank you for that. But um, I also wanted to ask you, because I think um, you referred to this in the in the documentary, how, you know, like kind of like the damage that it did to the image of the shark, um, the movie Jaws, and how like I'm also born in 75. So like I, I grew up with that. But it, I was really curious, like somebody like you that had, you know, the, the polls on Hollywood will choose to do a documentary as opposed to use a fiction, you know, use the platform of fiction cinema to tell a story, even if the shark was going to be the hero and the human monster, right? So what is it um, about the genre of documentary that you both think that, you know, helps us an educational tool and like reaches people in a way that is more direct, you know, towards action that perhaps um, you know, this perception of animals, you know, through cinema, through, through fiction cinema. Well, just to answer your question, um, I have thought about doing something nonfiction. I just have to write it and do it. It's a much longer process. But I thought before I did anything in fiction, I really wanted to document that Red, you know, Reggie and that any other activists could just point to and go like, okay, I, I can explain this to you. But if you sit and watch Finn in 90 minutes, you'll understand what the problem is and what we need to do to solve it. That was the, the main idea. And I think that, you know, it just happened in the pandemic. Everyone just started watching documentaries like crazy. I think that it used to be hard to get people to watch documentaries, but sort of now in the streaming world, it's really become part of our culture. And I think that we have a new generation that are very aware and that want to be activists and want to use their voice on social media. So, I mean, for me, 
I have to dive into it. I had to get on a fishing boat. I had to go out with Reggie in Mexico and see those fishermen. I had to go to the kitchens in Hong Kong so I could say that I genuinely know, I, I have an understanding of what I'm talking about. I'm not an expert, but I have enough experience that I can say, no, I literally went there and this is what, what's happening. Um, and I just wanted to use, you know, use my voice. Yeah, and also like for, for both of you, you know, something that is really important, you know, many things are really important, like politically positioning, you know, the issue in your film, but one of them is like really not to, um, not to clearly that you can blame, blame the small fishermen for trying to make a living and how what we need instead is provide them with alternatives so they can survive. So perhaps, you know, Regina, you can talk us a little bit about what was your experience in these, you know, experiences in Mexico with the Nakawa experiences and maybe about the educational programs and the support that these communities can receive so they can, you know, like just modify their economies. Of course, I think that's actually the beautiful part of Finn, like being able to be part of a common community of like, what are you doing, which sometimes it's hard to explain to the world. That was like the beautiful opportunity of like, finally, somebody's putting a documentary together with each which is not only one hero, it's about a lot of different people doing different things. On my experience, what I'm trying to do is to create this new model of sustainable ecotourism. Right now, I'm actually evolving my old project. Uh, Nakao Experiences was a tiny little way to start transforming uh, those fishermen in, into operations, into a more sustainable economy, long-term, um, you know, type of living and um right now we are actually partnering which uh with a sorry a partner that i can still reveal but we are creating this new model of high-end luxury economy mm, yeah model sorry um to try to create the most high-end experiences around the world in the last bubbles that are still pristine and wild um on my experience it's been a long journey you cannot arrive to a community and tell them what to do before like Eli you need to to see what's happening through the eyes you need to understand the culture behind it you need to understand the needs you need to understand why they do it how they do it when they do it and then start um, educating them with facts with data with numbers and with reality that that can be changed that actually if they keep doing what they are doing in 10 or 20 years, they won't have what they are seeing today. Um, it's a very hard work. Uh, it requires to live doing this. That's not my job, that's my life. I don't do anything else than trying to understand wildlife behavior, human behavior, community engagement, uh, trying to understand not only men or fishermen, but their families and where do they live the surroundings, the ecosystems around them, the assets, the natural assets that we can use to actually show them how we can really make happen projects and ideas where there's a high economic impact and low environmental impact. But you need to show them with facts and with reality. So Nakao Experiences was a tiny little seed that I put in Mexico to try to transform this um, different fishermen I was working with and bringing people from all over the world to have amazing adventures, you know, expeditions. Right now we are jumping into the next level. We are partnering with a bigger foundation. Our partners are Mar Vivo, which they work in climate, biodiversity and social programs. And together with them, we are partnering with even higher partners, the, you know, ex-owners or ex-founders of Six Senses are creating an amazing, beautiful project to protect the last pristine places on our earth. Together with high-end ecotourism and together with science, we believe we can still have, we still have a chance to save what's left. Of course, we cannot bring back um, everything. Um, I think we are in a emergency moment of our earth and natural resources but i still we i still have i still have the hope that we can protect these last places and hopefully recover the populations of different species that are drastically you know overfished everywhere and that they are also losing their ecosystems by climate change deforestation so it's not only about sharks 
It's about understanding how we bring different communities and partnership with different people that have different skills and strength to do our best with everything from protecting the place to protecting the species to help change the way that people is doing, you know, is living their lives. So it's a super long process. It's super hard. Um, it takes all the energy and passion that you can think you have and more than that. It's, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes uh, because not everybody's willing to listen, not everybody believes, not everybody's optimistic. So you need to have a lot of optimism inside of you to truly convince others that we still have an opportunity out there. Um, and I, I do want to just say thankfully for Reggie that she fostered such trust with the fishermen that, you know, the the gringo with the camera shows up and they were they were fine. They they let us film. You know, that would never have happened if Reggie wasn't so completely ensconced in, in the community. Yeah, you literally need to be part of them. I needed to forget the Spanish blonde girl I was to actually live in Mexico within these people, you know, be part of them, win their trust, win their trust to go and, and my trust too. I go out there with them with one single engine to the open ocean, 30 or 40 miles, just to understand the areas they are fishing, which species, when, and how we can make, you know, products out of it to inspire people to swim with them, not only with sharks, but other species. So the trust is both sides. And I didn't start this to do social programs or community projects. And there was a moment on my career where I understood that if I don't work with humans, I cannot save species. And that's also amazing because you evolve in within the conservation journey saying to yourself, well, I started as a super activist and I was super upset with every fishing, you know, um, operation out there. But actually with time, I thought they are my data, they are my information and they are the ones that have these pieces in their hands and that we actually need to change. I, so, I felt that, you know, I was saying, I felt that with in Boston with those fishermen where, you know, suddenly it's like, is he a Hollywood guy you know, or is he a Boston guy? I grew up there and they were so angry and they threw us out of the tournament and they, it almost got very ugly. Um, but we really just tried to not judge them and let them speak. Um, and I was, and people went and started shutting down the tournaments. People started going and protesting them and contacting the sponsors. And I was saying, you know, don't make anyone a villain. The people that are doing these shark fishing tournaments truly believe they're not doing anything wrong because that's what they've been, the fishing industry has spent billions of dollars to, for them to think that it's all okay. And I think what Reggie does so well is, you know, just treating the people with respect. You know, I, I understand it though. People would say, how could you make that movie and not want to kill, kill people when you see them beating sharks to death with a baseball bat? And you really have to just sort of try to understand, you know, the, the, I remember us, the two of us sitting in that boat was probably the sickest I felt in maybe my lifetime. And, and I just thought, Jesus, I'm just doing this one day. Reggie has to do this all the time, but you have to stomach it and just get the shots and, and try and understand their point of view and then make it into a, a movie that people can watch that's somewhat hopeful. You know, like Reggie said, there still is time um, to do it if we all get involved and use your voice and just make very conscious decisions about, about what you purchase and how. Our dollars are ultimately what's going to stop this. But I think one, you know, we, of course, we're not trying to demonize every single human, but I think um, we never get to speak with the CEOs of the big fisheries. And, you know, I think if there is any shadow element or like any bad guy of the story is like, you know, this like capitalist corporate greed that doesn't allow people to reason on, on what's really the facts at, at hand, right? And, you know, we never hear any, any of those kinds of people in the film. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's very complicated. Um, but yeah, no, we, there... we tried. I mean, there, a lot of it is, uh, they, they call them the Galician Mafia. I mean, a lot of the fishery people just had no interest in going on camera. The best, we, we were able to get the head of the Shark Fin Associations in Hong Kong on mm -hmm. camera. That I was very happy about. But even getting on that ship that I went on in Liberia, you know, we almost got, it almost got very, very ugly, as you saw in the film. So yeah, I was going to ask you about that, too, like, it, you know, because a lot of our viewers are also documentarians that do investigations and get themselves into like really, you know, complicated situations. So perhaps you can let us in a little bit about like what kind of like, you know, um, 
uh, production mechanisms you have in place or you know if there are any any safety issues that that you were dealing with that you can well, definitely i mean you can't just show up i mean you can show up with a camera and get provocative footage but you know we always if if humans are getting hurt making the movie it's not it's, it's you, you should you have to be able to make your movie make your point without anyone's jeopardizing anyone's safety that being said, we sort of taking calculated risks, and it was the Minister of Defense of Liberia that invited us in. That's how we got special permission to enter the country. Um, and so we went out with Sea Shepherd and uh, Guy Median, who's you know these Israeli special forces, and so with the the Liberian Coast Guard and Guy, we just went and we boarded. And they had been on that ship six months earlier. Someone had been attacked with a knife, one of the soldiers, and they said, if if you shoot anyone, it's an international incident. And they'd been sitting in this port for six months and the minister of defense held the boat for us because someone paid, you know, some shell company paid to let the boat go. So it could, I mean, this thing was just like vacuuming the ocean floor, just devastating populations of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, we just said, this is a risk I have to take for the film. I was actually in the middle of editing my movie for Amblin, the house of the clock and its walls. I was like, I'll be right back. I'm going to come in late. And I flew to Liberia and got in this boat. I didn't tell anyone what I did. And there was that moment where we were in the freezer where the people up were above were screaming and all of the, you know, the fishermen just started like raising their voices and getting rowdy and screaming at the guards. And some were cool, but some, some of them were very upset and they wanted, you know, they wanted blood. And so we were just like, let's get the hell out of here. So we, but I was scared we could get trapped in the freezer, but we got the footage. I mean, I just, but I get it. They've been, they'd been held there for six months without pay. So it wasn't like evil fishermen. These people are, it's basically slave labor. And we found that's the one thing I really learned was, you know, that other boat, the high lung that was there, we went on, um, people get brought out. I mean, they're left on these boats for three years at a time. And then sometimes they're not paid. Sometimes they're just thrown overboard. Sometimes they just don't get their money. I mean, it's really, there's a whole kind of human trafficking element to the fishing that nobody talks about and nobody sees. And these vessels are subsidized by EU subsidies. I mean, the, the whole thing, you know, we wanted to show it at the kind of the village level. And I remember being with Reggie and we just started calculating how many sharks these boats could kill. And then she said to me, now imagine this all up and down the boats of the coast of Baja California, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, you know, when, when you were talking about the, yeah, I was gonna ask you about that too, kind of like how, these legal European funds are intertwined with the criminal entities. Like, can you explain a little bit more about that, what that means, and if that happens only like in Spain and Europe, or if that happens more places around the world? Well, the I mean, politicians, a lot of them are, I mean, I'm not saying all politicians are corrupt. And really, Peter Hammerstead and C. Shepard is the expert, and I would definitely defer to him for these kind of details because he's on the front lines dealing with a lot of this stuff, but he was explaining to me that the European Union gives oil and gas subsidies to these boats to keep them at sea so that people can have, you know, they basically go to Liberia, they illegally take the fish, they change the markings of what's in the hold, and then they ship it. And then people around Europe can get their delicious fish for cheap. I mean, the people in Africa are starving because the Chinese boats and European boats are coming and sucking up all the fish and then bringing it back to Europe to serve in nice restaurants. So it, it really is like a, the fishing industry makes, makes so much money. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and they spend a lot of money, you know, kind of to keep it that way. But they, uh, the, the shark fins that are imported, it's, it's impossible. I mean, you saw the, the cases. I mean, there, there are these shipping containers and shipping containers, thousands of them going in Hong Kong and less than 1% are inspected. And they just look at the manifest and it's just says fish. And then you're, it's all supposed to be self-declared. I mean, it's, it's horrible. In, in one thing that we checked in, there was great whites and hammerheads and endangered sharks. But what are you going to do? I mean, all the fins look the same. So you DNA test it and it's, what are you going to return it? You can't put it back on the shark. So the, the whole thing, there's no one policing the waters. And even during COVID, everyone said, oh, they'll take a break. Well, it got worse because now there was no police. The Costa Rican police weren't in the waters. I mean, Reggie was telling me, that as soon as COVID hit, the police that were outside Cocos Island left and the fishermen just went in to these protected areas and they just stuck up all the fish. It's, it's horrible. And it's, but you know, we, the people are the consumers. We're eating it. And, and you also, um, you know, something that I really think is important is the way that you crafted the tone of the film. So it's hard to watch, but not so gory that you can't watch, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, 
sometimes we get desensitized with certain images. So tell us a little bit about like, you know, walking that line in editing, you know, like to what point like you were like bringing us to these lotter moments and us like taking us away a little bit and bringing us these beautiful moments where we swim with the char sharks and these, you know, encounters with these great activists like, you know, Regina and like the Sea Shepherd people. Um, how did you balance out those elements? So, so the crafting of the editing is exciting and we're going with you to Liberia and to China and to Mexico. And, but at the same time, we're like being told a terrible story. You know, it's like with horror movies, I always say every story has its own level of gore. And if it becomes silly or you don't want to watch what happens next, then it's too much. But if you go, wow, I can't like you're shocked, but you've got to see it. You got, you want to see what happens next. That's always my barometer. And in the movie, it was actually Leonardo DiCaprio who was very helpful in editing because we had the stuff we filmed in Mexico with me and Reggie, it was so much, you know, I want to show these beautiful animals basically being turned into these carcasses, just carved up and then dragged through the water. It was with the babies, it was so much. And, and Leo was the one who told me when he watched the first cut, he's like, when it starts to become animal cruelty, it's all animal cruelty, but when it feels like excessive animal cruelty, I can't watch anymore. It's too hard. When it's shocking and I get the point, I get angry and I want to see what I can do about it. And that's what you want. You want everyone to get to that boiling point of feeling that rage, but now how do we channel it and what do we do? And, you know, I think, you know, as, as hard as it is for Reggie, you know, she's in her own thing and she doesn't see the reactions of people watching the movie, but she's incredibly inspiring and watching what Peter and Sea Shepherd and Gary and Oceans Asia and what everyone's doing um, you know, there is a really good feeling that there's great people out there fighting the fight. It doesn't mean we all can take our foot off the gas and let up, but I just saw it, you know, at the end with Boston, with the fishermen there, I wound up putting the theme song from Cannibal Holocaust, which is one of my favorite cannibal horror movies. And I wrote to the composer's family and I asked them and they, they, they let me use it as a, as a favor for the film because it was just so absurd. It was like, you couldn't, I mean, it almost, it wasn't funny, but it just became like insane with these people bragging about killing these sharks and kids are watching going, what are you doing? And they're all thinking that they're doing this wonderful thing. And people are like, this is, this is happening in Boston, in our backyard. Like people just couldn't believe it. So that's part of it is you want to sort of shock people into being like, wake them up and wanting to do something. But if you go too far with the violence, no one's going to watch it because who wants to see that? It's too, it's too off-putting. So I, I don't know how Reggie can do it, you know, day after day. It's really, you know, it's hard. And well, um, yeah, sorry, go sorry. ahead, Reggie. Go ahead, please. Well, I mean, I just wanted to add here that of course it's it's hard. Um, with time, you kind of like get more used to it. That doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt you. However, I'm also all the time fulfilling my soul and myself, like seeing them alive. Um, not only sharks, but other beautiful species and, and understanding how the ecosystems work and how the food chain work. So for me, my balance is like, I need to see literally the wall breaking, you know, in front of me, but then I also need to see life. I also need to feel the animals. I need to go out there and just like swim with them and have literally days where I like kind of like meditate with them together feeling part of if I wouldn't have the two sides I wouldn't be able to do that and that's one of the reasons that I moved from Costa Rica into Baja because the direction that we were taking in Costa Rica back then with Nakawa project was really international policy working in you know big vessels big containers all the time was like dead animals samples here samples there laboratories international uh congresses and there was a moment that I was like completely depressed. And I was like, why am I doing this? I'm forgetting the reason I, I, I am doing this. And the reason I'm doing this is because I simply love animals and nature. And it, they make me feel alive. And they make me have a reason to breathe every day. So that was the reason I moved into Baja to take a different direction and a different approach, work within communities instead of directly with governments or like, you know, international trade, which is, it, it needs to be done, but I couldn't continue that way. I needed to be in the water with the animals, with the fishermen, with the communities and create this perfect, imperfect wall and balance for myself to be able to do what I do. I won't be able to, you know, do any step in conservation if I wouldn't be 
free to swim and experience the intimacy of like wild encounters with different biodiversity. It would be impossible. Ruth, to answer your question about sort of the government blocking, people blocking policy, a perfect example is um, Reggie said, I want to go to CITES where to get short fin makos listed as appendix two. Now, first, trading any sharks we think is insane, but we also know that there is a trade going on. So you can't just, unless people just stop buying it all together and there's a public outcry, it's not going to happen. So Reggie and Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation stepped up and they said, we'll send you. And they paid to send Reggie to CITES to get this done. So Reggie goes and Canada blocks it because they're like short fin makos, they're fine. Even though they're pelagic and they go all over the world, one person from Canada blocked putting short fin makos on CITES2 you know, appendix or endangered because they're like, well, we tested them in Canada. There's no problem. Meanwhile, that doesn't, it's not representative of the entire world, but obviously someone's paying them to keep it, to keep the short fin makeup. Like, why would you want to kill and eat short fin makeup? It's totally insane. And Canada's like, well, we banned shark fin. Well, yeah, but they're not banning the trade of it. It's, it was so insane because they were touting like, oh, we don't import shark fin anymore, but they had perfect, their Canada had an opportunity. And I remember Re Reggie just came back completely devastated that the politicians were just complete, were just, they just didn't do it. And uh, tell us a little bit, just to end, um, because we're going to have to let let you go soon. But um, what um, what are the current legislation efforts, you know, to ban fin fishing in the U.S. And how can people help you in your efforts to stop this horrible situation? Well, on the fin movie, we have uh, kind of different websites and organizations. Shark Allies is a great one um, in the United States that they've been they've been really pushing, um, you know, for the to ban. The, but we're really trying to get it passed in Florida to ban shark fishing and ban fin sales because that, that's the number one uh, state. And we feel like if, if that can happen in Florida, then the rest of the domino should fall pretty easily. Um, right now, it's, it's like illegal to have shark fin soup in California and Hawaii just banned shark fishing, but you can still go out and fish sharks legally. There's no, there's no law against it. Um, but I think the best thing you can do is Staying active, uh, watch the products you consume, demand that they're shark free, uh, using your voice and really look up Google monster shark tournament on the East Coast and contact those sponsors and say this is not okay and contact the towns. Look in Long Island, look in New Bedford, look in Nantucket and go on the Twitter of the mayors and go how can you allow this, this animal cruelty on a public dock that these sponsors are paying for, because a lot of people are told it's a fishing tournament for charity. So a lot of the restaurants that are, they just go, hey, do you want to do something for charity for the community? They say, of course they do. They don't realize what they're, the Boston Bruins, they put their logos on there. I mean, it's crazy. So Fleet Bank. So it's, I think it's just getting involved and poking around. It's, it's amazing what you can do with just a little bit of activism on social media. And Reggie, how can you, uh, how, how can you, how can we support like your efforts at this day? What are you working on at the moment that you would like people to support you? So... I mean, very, very soon uh, we will be able to launch, uh, as I was saying, this new project. Um, we're still working with fishermen, actually. Uh, yesterday I was with one of the fishermen that appears in, in the movie with Eli uh, out there just looking for mobulas and orcas. Um, now it's the perfect season to do that. And we hire them, we bring different groups. So how you can support us, just like continue following what's next. Right now, of course, you can still um, get involved in NACAO projects, support NACAO experiences, support Mar Vivo, our partners. Um, but very, very soon, like join an expedition that is actually going to change a community economy and the future of different endangered species. I think there's a need of like sharing this film, you know, inspiring more people to get involved. There's a lot of tiny little battles. There's no only one. It's not only... Um, the problems in Baja, it's not only the shark meat consumption, it's not only the, the shark fin, it's, it's everything, right? So just pick one and stick with it and be a little bit constant. This is like falling in love, no? Like if you put a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, finally it probably happen, but you need to choose one. So I think there's for everyone. Uh, you can get involved uh, with social media, you can get involved in the field, you can get involved through ecotourism, you can get involved with science from, uh, legislation to implementation of laws and actually making them happen.
because sometimes they only exist in papers. So go out there and check yourself. Go to the supermarket, check if the shark meat that they are selling is labeled or not. If it's not, report it to us. Um, and ask questions, ask questions to your friends, to the people that is still selling shark meat, why they do it. Like, I think that every one of us has one skill and one type of voice, just use it for the good, for sharks, for different type of wildlife. But it's now or never, like in 10 years, we won't be able to go back. Yeah. Um, and we still have the opportunity. So let's just do it. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for bringing us um, this incredible film, Finn, and we will definitely support everything that you do in the future. And I hope you all at home will tell everyone to watch this film and to start watching for um, shark related products and continue the fight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you.